You're listening to the VBMA podcast. Hi there, and welcome to the VBMA podcast. This episode being entitled Anything is Possible. My name is Doug Ferry, and I'm a fourth year veterinary student at Texas A&M. I'm currently serving as the VBMA 2023 National Marketing Director and will be the host for this episode. Before diving into the content of today's episode, I'd like to first tell you about three of our loyal sponsors, Nationwide, AVMA Family, and Purina, who have made this episode possible. For almost 20 years, Nationwide has been honored to stand as a founding sponsor of the VBMA. Their goal is to help provide relevant educational content to empower aspiring veterinarians to take a holistic approach to pet health care and meet pet families where they are. The AVMA is your association, whether you're looking for professional resources or no-cost insurance options for SAVMA members, the AVMA family of AVMA and AVMA Trust have your back. Purina Pro Plan Veterinary Diets and Supplements is a proud partner of veterinary professionals. Visit purinaforprofessionals.com to learn more. We are very appreciative of these sponsors here at the VBMA and express a sincere thank you for their continued support. Now today, we are very lucky to have Dr. Brandy Duya as our featured guest. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Yes, no problem. To tell you a little bit about Dr. Brandy, she embraces her role as a teacher, mentor, and role model for students with and without disabilities. She received her Bachelor of Science from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette in 2005, and her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from the Louisiana State University School of Veterinary Medicine in 2013. Since graduating Louisiana State University, Dr. Brandy has shared her story with hundreds of future veterinarians to empower them to find their own path in veterinary medicine. In addition to her passions of mentorship and supporting veterinary students, Dr. Brandy's clinical interests include general practice, shelter medicine, disaster response, and high-quality, high-volume spay-neuter. In her role with Heartland Veterinary Partners, Dr. Brandy helps match students with externships and jobs within general practices throughout the Midwest, South, and Southeast that provide excellent mentorship and opportunities for unique career growth. Essentially, there is nothing that Dr. Brandy can't do, and we are so lucky to have her with us. Thank you again for being here with us today. Absolutely. I'm very excited. So Dr. Brandy, to get things started, I'd love to understand a little bit more about your background. Tell us about yourself. So I am a country girl from the deep south, from Louisiana. I grew up in a little town called Indian Bayou, Louisiana. Not many people have heard of it. My father is a farmer, and one of my classmates said, like a real farmer, and yes, he's a real farmer. We farm rice and crawfish and soybeans and was a homemaker. You know, my father graduated from high school. My mom has a eighth grade education. So definitely a very, very poor side of town, you know, kind of clawed, I clawed my way to the top and very family oriented and, and family means every, everything to us here in the South. That is so awesome. I didn't realize that we had so much in common. I actually also grew up on a farm and my dad is a farmer. So what a cool connection that we have. Yeah, there. I think, yeah, I think it definitely humbles you and it, and it helps you realize what's important in life and, and what it means to work hard. We definitely have seen that throughout your life. I think one of the biggest lessons that we can learn from your experience is that you are persevering and hardworking. And I'd love to get more into a little bit about your story of how those lessons have blessed you as you've approached and handled specific challenges through you, throughout your life. So Dr. Brandy was telling me about her story of when she was diagnosed with meningitis and I, and the challenges that included and how she overcame those. And I'd love to open up the, the floor to you telling us more about that specific experience that you had many years ago. So how, how old were you? How did this all come to be? 
So it was in 1995. I was 13 years old and I, I wasn't a very sickly child. Yes, every year I probably caught the common cold during the winter and that kind of stuff. I guess you could say as normal as you can be a normal kid, not really sick. And then one day, 13 years old, one night I was sick. I was sleeping with my nephew who was about seven months old and I felt very ill like the flu and I got up and I went to my mom and my mom said, you know what to do? You're sick. Go in the bathroom. If you need me, call me. And so I had stayed in that bathroom majority of the night. And the next day I didn't get better. I, I continued to get worse. And then, you know, at one point my mom had flipped my hand over and looked at my, on my waist and she saw bruising. And so she said, have, were you and your sister rough housing? And I was like, no, you know, and I, and she was like, she didn't really understand what the bruising was about. And then I started telling her that the whole left side of my body was stiff. Like I couldn't move it. I couldn't look at the light. I couldn't really bend my neck. And at, at a certain point, she she said, you know, I think this has gone far enough. I think we need to go to the doctor to try to figure out what's going on. Go to the doctor. And unfortunately, by the time I had got to the hospital, so at driving there, I could no longer keep my head up and my head kept hitting the window because I had no longer had any control over my neck. And then, you know, once we got to, to the hospital, I was unable to walk. I was basically just, uh, my family drug me into the hospital. Um, and the doctor said he had seen this in one other child. And unfortunately, that child didn't make it. And so a spinal tap was performed. And he said, I don't really know what's going on. But he asked my mom if I was allergic to penicillin. And she said, I don't really know. And she said, he said, unfortunately, She's either going to die from the penicillin or she's going to die from this meningitis. And so that's how that went. And, you know, after he administered that medication, you know, he said there was nothing else that he could do for me. You know, like I said, I lived in a, a very rural town and, and it was a hospital that wasn't able to provide the care that he thought that I needed. And so then I was shipped to the local biggest city. And that's kind of where all the adventures began. Wow. What an incredibly difficult thing to process out of nowhere. How, how were you feeling when this was all transpiring? Really and truly, I thought I was sick. I thought I had the flu. I, I thought, but then, you know, once the bruising started, which that was my clotting mechanism was starting to set off. And once that started, we knew that that was a clinical sign that's not associated with the common cold or the common flu. And so really and truly, to be honest with you, Doug, at, at that time, I had no idea what to expect. I didn't realize how big this was. And looking back now, I'm very lucky to be alive. And I'm very lucky that instinct that my mother had to bring to the hospital because the doctor said, you know, after everything was said and done or I was more stabilized, they said if I, she'd have waited two more hours, it would have been too late. And then if she would have brought me two hours early, they would have just diagnosed me with the flu and sent me home and she'd have found me no longer alive in my room. So very lucky that she brought me within that window. What I am hearing there is that you experienced a miracle. You were truly watched over Absolutely. and you were cared for and your mom was so intuitive and you use the word luck, but it truly was miraculous that you were able to receive that care that you needed. So after you had received your initial treatment and had been transferred to this larger hospital, how did things transpire from there? It took about two weeks for them to, to identify exactly what was wrong or, or what I had. It took them about two weeks to figure that out. And so really and truly, it was for the first two weeks, it was just stabilizing me to try to keep me alive um, because my body was going through so much. And then the, the amputation and the damage that I have is only two hours worth because, you know, once I was there at the hospital when they administered me all that penicillin, so it killed everything. Fortunately, I was not allergic to penicillin, so I'm still here but it killed everything. So what I have, the damage is two hours worth. And so basically the two weeks leading up to the diagnosis of identifying was basically just trying to keep me alive and keeping my body from going into shock. And I did go into DIC. And so once I was stable, then the rehabilitation phase or the debridement phase of removing all of that tissue that was no longer viable and, and setting me on, on the, the beginning of the path to trying to recover. Wow. So take us, take us through th some of the process of what transpired as you had mentioned the amputation process. Tell us more about what you, what was determined, the decisions that were made and how you were feeling as I was all underway. Yeah. Yeah. Like we said, I was 13 years old, right? So I'm at an age where images everything. And I was, was very smart. I was the salutatorian of my class. In my mind, I knew that there was no way that these hands were going to stay, but 
also in my mind, I thought there was just going to be some way that it was going to work, um, that maybe my hands wouldn't be the same, but that, I, that, you know, the thought that I wouldn't have hands was the furthest thing from my mind, though I knew all the way in the back that this was not that what I had was not viable uh, with life, what I had left. And it was really hard. And I went through tons of therapy and I went through tons of surgeries. The doctors didn't know how much of my body was going to be left. I did about 20, 23 or 27 hyperbaric uh, chamber treatments. And that's why I'm left with the length of my arms that I have and, and my legs uh, and what I have left in my legs. But there was a time whenever they would go in and they would, they would amputate at every joint of my fingers just to make sure to see if it would bleed and if it was viable. And then at some point, the doctor said my body could no longer stand the anesthesia. And so he said that they were going to cut until they saw blood. And it was it was pretty devastating. He came, I'll never forget it. He came in my room and he had on a white coat, but I think it was like a Leonard Skinner or some kind of bad company t-shirt on. And uh, he said, you know, walked in and said, the hands have got to come off tomorrow. And though I knew that was the case, I wasn't prepared for that. I don't think anybody would have been prepared for that. And, and that's exactly what happened. The next day I was, you know, I was prepared that night for surgery for the next day and my hands were amputated and they amputated until they, they got blood and they thought that they had viable tissue. Those of us listening, we can only imagine the difficulty of all of this taking place, of receiving that news, of processing that and coming to, trying to come to terms with that recommendation from the doctor that it, it seems almost impossible to be able to be okay with that and to even know what to think at that time at such a, a young age and to not really seemingly have a huge say in what is taking place. That is so difficult. I'm so sorry that took place. So what did it end up being by the time all of your operations were done? How many operations did you have? And did you have your limbs removed? Tell us more about that. Yeah. Um, my right arm is longer than my left, but so my right arm, I probably have about four inches below the elbow and my left arm, I probably have about three. And so both the hands had to come off above the wrist. And like I said, my right arm is longer than my left. And that's, I'm very fortunate. I mean, I know there are people like, how can you be fortunate? I'm very fortunate. I was left with my elbows because I use them to grab things, to, to do different things. And I use my arms like two fingers, except they're just not on one hand. And yes, things are difficult and it's not always easy, but I'm very fortunate that I'm still capable of doing multiple things. And it was very hard. It wasn't easy. I wasn't prepared. I don't think anybody would ever be prepared for something like that to happen in their life. As we talked about when the doctor came in, I didn't know how to react. I had less than 24 hours to adjust to the fact that my hands were coming off. It was no longer amputating until we thought that it was viable. It, they were coming off. and so. It was a reality check, you know, and it was one that I was not prepared for at 13 years old. So how did you cope at this stage of your experience? Yeah, so I'm going to tell So my parents have been divorced since I'm three months old and they've had significant others. I've known my step parents since I'm that age as well. And I, my family is the number one reason why I'm alive today. And anybody, I, it doesn't matter what anybody says, I know that for a fact that it's my family. Um, that is the reason that I'm alive. And my um, two sets of parents stayed with me uh, the entire time when I was in Lafayette. They stayed with me throughout and and they helped me cope. My family, I always had visitors, not even immediate further family that would come over, people, friends. And so, you know, that that kept me positive, but I'm a pretty positive person to begin with. And I get that from my father, but I don't know. I just didn't see it as an option to give up. That wasn't an option for me. Um, you know, and a lot of people say, you know, I'm scared to die. And, and that's not something that I'm scared to do. What I'm scared to do is to die and to leave my family in that heartache. And so I knew that wasn't an option for me. Um, was it depressing and was it life shattering? Absolutely. Did I know how I was going to go on? Like, how was I going to tie my shoes? Was I even going to be able to feed myself? You know what? I'm from Louisiana. How was I going to peel my crawfish? Simple things like that. That's very important. I just, I worked through it. And when I did get out of the hospital, I was supposed to go to therapy and I went to therapy for two weeks and I didn't stay because they, and they were trying to help me and I appreciated it. They were like, we can try this on your arm for you to be able to write. And I said, well, why can't I just write with two arms? Like what if this instrument breaks and then I can't write at all? And so I basically, what I know I've learned, I, I went to therapy for two weeks and then I was done with it because I said I couldn't get up early anymore. 
And so I've taught myself, you know, you just have to think out of the box and, and I'm very persistent. I don't give up. And I think that's what has has pushed me as far as I am. I can only think about the challenges that all of us face, whether seen or unseen. And to have an example like you, to know that if we keep moving forward, if we do not entertain the option of giving up, if we are persistent, if we have that mentality that somehow this is going to work, we can overcome these challenges that are in front of us that seem impossible to surpass. That is incredible that you were able to, at such a young age, have that mentality of perseverance to stick to the task and to not give up. Congratulations on that. That is, you're just, you're a shining star to, and an inspiration to all of us in such a difficult situation that didn't just stop at one day, at one moment. It's something that you continue to experience and navigate. How did you bridge the gap, so to speak, between this heart shattering experience and becoming a veterinarian? <laughs> Take us into a window of your life of how you, how that came to be, how you accomplished that. Absolutely. Uh, well, I mean, the way that it is normally is people say, you know, I've wanted to be a vet since I was three years old. I love animals. That wasn't the case with me. I knew, you know, from the time that I had spent in the hospital, I knew that I wanted to do something in the medical field. And so really when I first got out of the hospital and I started going to undergrad college, I thought that I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to do something in the medical field. So I knew that I was going to um, get a bachelor's in science, and, but I just didn't know what. And I first thought that I wanted to do anesthesiology. And then I was like, oh, man, that's a big responsibility. And then I realized I really can't do people. And so at that time, I was working at a gym and I was bartending at a bar. And I met a, a veterinarian that came into the gym and I said, well, maybe I bet I could do veterinary medicine. Obviously, I had animals as a child, right? To say that I always wanted to be a veterinarian is not the case. And so I, I just thought that you know, that is the medical, that is the medical field. And it doesn't have anything to do with people. I mean, it does because owners, but I can work with animals. And was I afraid maybe I couldn't do it? Yeah, for sure. But it's not something that I was going to give up on easily. And so that vet, uh, her name is Dr. Renee Poirier. She's one of my mentors, an amazing mentor. And, and, you know, I love the relationship I have with her because, you know, she's honest and true. You know, when I told her that I wanted to apply to vet school, she said, now you realize no one's going to think you can do it, Brandy. And how are you going to prove to them that you can? You know, and at that time in my life, I was like, wow, I have to constantly prove myself. But I think, you know, as I've matured and grown up, I've realized that I'm not the only one that has to constantly prove myself. When new grads graduate all the time, they go on job interviews, they have to prove that they can do those surgeries. And so nothing makes me special that I have to prove myself. What makes me special is how I prove myself. Um, and so that took a long time for me to come to terms with, uh, but I have, and I'm really happy that I have. She gave me the option to go work at the clinic and, you know, she didn't, I had no special treatment. Um, I first started off working in kennels and I had to work every holiday like everyone else does. And then I moved to reception, which is a position I absolutely love. I could work reception. I'm a people person. Um, any day of the week, I love answering the phones. And then I moved to a, a technician and then I moved to a surgical technician. And by the time I was there, um, I had been accepted to vet school. And so I, I pursued a career through vet school. But I mean, I, literally, I was just at her clinic today, you know, just seeing how everybody was doing. So it's definitely a place that that I'm very comfortable. Um, and uh, it was just it was a great experience. And it, it just confirmed that veterinary medicine was for me. It sounds like there was a door that was open to you that seemed to be meant to be open for you. You had this mentor, Dr. Renee, who believed in you. She did not sugarcoat anything for you, but she gave you an opportunity to walk through that door and to prove yourself. And then all of this tenacity that you had developed over years and years then served you so well to be able to do that very thing, to demonstrate that you had what it took to pursue an interest, a love of a field that resonated with you. So it's so cool to see the impact that literally one person had on you that informed your entire professional career. And the, also the fact that you were just barely at that hospital today, that over all of these years, 
you have stayed connected, and that that impact on your life is still relevant today. That is absolutely incredible. My understanding is that you applied to veterinary school four times, and that as part of the application process, you needed to show, like you're saying, that you are capable of being successful in this field. I think you sent in a video of you drawing blood or placing a catheter or something to that degree. And that was a way that you were able to truly demonstrate that you were able to function successfully and efficaciously as a medical team member. And then after that, you got into veterinary school, right? Tell us about how that came to be. Yeah. So you're right. It did take me. I applied to vet school four times and every time I would apply, I would get an interview. So I knew they liked me, but I 100% understand their reservation. You know, they knew they saw my grade point average. They they saw the work I had done. They knew I could do the book work, but really and truly physically, could I do it? You know, um, and I think it's very important for those with disabilities before they embark on something to have an idea of how they're going to and approach that. Because to be honest with you, Doug, if I would have went into vet school and I would have failed, that would have not turned out well for those with disabilities, right? Um, but I didn't. I went into vet school and I succeeded. Um, but, you know, Dr. Renee played a big part in that. She told me, Brandy, it's easy to tell somebody, hey, I don't have any hands, but I can do dentals and I can pull blood, put catheters, and I'm great at restraint. And somebody, you could tell them that, but they're not going to believe it. They can't see it in their mind's eye. They have to really see it. And so, you know, I said, okay. And I did a video and I sent it to them and I sent it to them on my third application. I still didn't get accepted, but on my fourth application, I did. And, and that video had gone around the entire school. So everybody had looked at it. Um, and so they knew that it was possible. And, and I guess they decided that was something that they were going to take a chance on. But by no means that I try, I never, ever use my disability to say, well, I didn't get in. So it would have been easy to say I didn't get into vet school because it was discrimination because I don't have any hands. I, I feel like that is very important for those with disabilities not to use that as a crutch. It does make us who we are, but make sure when you go into something, you know that you can do it. When all of my classmates were out partying and having a great time, because we all know the, the history of LSU, um, I was at home trying to figure out how I was going to do suture. How was I going to hold an instrument? Was I even going to be able to wear gloves? Like, what were the things and the adaptations that I was going to have to make in order to um, to do the physical part of veterinary medicine? So when you had experiences, when you felt limited, say when you are trying to figure out how to suture or you're trying to figure out how to glove up, when mm -hmm. you had these moments of feeling limited, what has been your thought process to find those solutions? Like I said, I never really give up. And so giving up was never an option for me. And was it difficult? Absolutely. Did I do it 300 times and said, this is not acceptable? Absolutely. But I never really gave up on trying. And I and that's just not my way and not who I am. I knew that it could be done, right? There has to be a way. It's not one way for something to be done. There's more than one way to spay a cat. You know, I kept that in mind. And, and do I do things by myself? No, I don't. Do I get assistance from a technician or students and to help me wrap the suture around my instrument? Absolutely. But I know what I'm doing and I know what a square knot is. And that's what I love teaching students because rather than a student standing out there and observing, they're in the surgery with me. They're my hands. And so it, I definitely don't want to make people think, oh my gosh, she does surgery by herself. And no, absolutely. I have assistance, but that's why we have technicians. And so, you know, you just got to think out of the box and figure things out. I was always the MacGyver of the clinic. If we dropped something between the cabinets, I would uh, tape up two, two tongue depressors and then put, you know, so you just got to figure it out. So what I'm hearing is you take this limitation that you're experiencing and you let that experience serve as a time to be creative and then Absolutely. this this solution comes to you and this served you so well so well you developed a love for shelter medicine you were in that field if i remember correctly for 7 years as a shelter medicine doctor and then you returned to LSU and helped teach surgery in their preclinical program for years you got involved in disaster response. You were a part of emergency medicine as a veterinarian. You did relief in general practice. And now you are currently recruiting students to be able to find their careers and be successful in their journeys as future veterinarians. 
it is so cool to see how because you did not give up, because you were persistent, you were able to carve out with grit and with hard work these beautiful experiences and not only do that for yourself, but then to be an inspiration for so many of us. A question that I have for you is on this journey, looking back, what what are the biggest takeaways from your experiences up to this point that you would like to share with us? I think a lot of people feel something that a lot of people like you've got to be kidding is I, I have no regrets in anything I've done ever. I have no regrets. I, you know, I am not. And a lot of people think, how can that be? Like, I, I am not bitter for what has happened to me. I'm very fortunate because, you know, if what would have happened to me didn't, if it didn't happen to me, I would never be who I am today. My family was, is very poor. I would have never been able to go to college. I would have never been able to pursue a career such as veterinary medicine. And so that that is just something that I'm very thankful for. And I just, I don't know, Doug, and, and a lot of people ask me questions about how do you stay positive? How do you do this? How do you keep going? And it's just not an option for me to quit. Well, your positivity is definitely contagious and it's something that lights up the room no matter where you go. You do such a good job of connecting with others and to feel inspired that they can move forward, that they can overcome their challenges, that there is opportunity for them in this life, that they can be successful with whatever they put their mind to. And your life is an example that those things are true. From meeting with you tonight, we have learned so much. We've been able to learn that if there's something difficult or seemingly impossible in front of us, we can accomplish that task at hand. We can be creative. We can be problem solvers. We can find solutions. Uh, when you have felt burnt out or overwhelmed, you mentioned to me that there were times that you were depressed. It was not always roses. It wasn't always peachy. Absolutely. But the love of your work of veterinary medicine, the love of people was able to help you push through those dark moments you are absolutely you're definitely an inspiration of that as our careers unfold they will refine they will blossom and that we shouldn't be bitter like you were saying but we should enjoy the ride and then also that our experiences that we have aren't just for ourselves oh absolutely not the experiences that we have are to help us learn help us grow help us become but also to through our personal experiences to then share that with others and to help them learn, help them grow, help them become. We all have challenges. We all have difficulties. And the common denominator, denominator here is that we need each other. Like your family was there for you. Like Dr. Renee was there for you. Like you are here for us right now. We all need each other as we are nav navigating these experiences. So thank you so much for your shining example of working hard, being vigilant, and being hopeful when there was every reason not to do those things. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Randy, we are so thankful for your time today to share your, your story with us, to be vulnerable with us, and to give us insight into what it takes to find purpose amidst the challenges that we experience. Do you have any departing thoughts before we end our time today? I, I just, I'm definitely a resource for anybody that needs, it, it doesn't matter what it is. If you guys have an idea or this is, I'm facing this challenge, or even if it's not a challenge that I've faced before, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'd love to help in any way possible. And there are bad times, but you know, you have to know bad times in order to know good times. And you just have to keep going you know, giving up is not, is in, is not an option in veterinary medicine or in life. It's not an option for us. And so we just have to strive to be our best and, and to do all every day. Thank you so much. How can our listeners contact you? What would be the best way for them to reach out if needed? Sure. So they can you know, email me. So my email is in H B. V-E-T. So it stands for No Handed Bandit Vet 
at gmail.com. So nhbvet at gmail.com. And then also on Instagram, I am at no handed bandit is my handle on Instagram. Thank you. I hi- highly encourage our listeners to reach out to you and to connect with you and to follow your journey. And I do not doubt that you will continue to bless many people by sharing your story. For those who are listening, if you have been enjoying this episode tonight, we invite you to follow the VBMA on Instagram, where you can be notified of episodes that will be released with time on our podcast. We recently released one about conflict, when and how. And moving forward, we will have episodes about student debt and the honors portfolio. Until then, we wish you all the very best. Good luck with everything that you are experiencing and take care.